So, you know, this was a big surprise to me, actually. Um, I was a real troublemaker when I was a kid. And if they'd ever checked out my record, I don't think they would have given me this. Um, I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. But you've really got to do something about the name of this award, you know, this lifetime thing. It's like, hey, lifetime, you did a great job. We love you. And it's checkout now. And, and so how about calling it something like you did great and keep it up award? And, and if you don't keep doing great, we're going to take it back. It's sort of, it's sort of more hopeful. I think I'm here because I had, like it said in that film, I, I had an epiphany in my 40s when I woke up and I realized that literally everything I'd ever studied either no longer existed or had uh, changed so much that you wouldn't have known it was the same thing. And of course it was all because of us, um, but the magnitude and the speed of the change really freaked me out. My first job was at Johns Hopkins. Um, I got tenure. It takes 10 years for tenure. Or I, you have to make full professor for tenure, and I somehow survived all that. And I, I got there because I would sort of invented a new Darwinian approach to coral reef ecology with my students, and, and it, was, it was a really cool thing. But I can tell you that although we thought we were the best and the brightest, when the coral reefs of the Caribbean collapsed in the 1980s, we had no idea that was going to happen. We had no understanding, really, of why it was happening. And I sort of realized, you know, oh my god, I just, I thought I knew what was going on, and I didn't. And, and you know, in the, in the face of all that kind of carnage, business as usual science really seems sort of decadent. I mean, I had spent 15 years studying bryozoans, which nobody has ever heard about, working on questions, esoteric questions, of the relative importance of competition and predation in ecosystem health, but that was all sort of moot if there weren't any ecosystems. And so, bit by bit, I switched. <clears throat> now, you know, making the transition, <clears throat> there's this big war about applied science versus basic science, but what people forget is it's, it's either good science or it's bad science. And really, all anybody needed to do, uh, who had a little bit of distance from the details, was to do good science and look what was going on, and boy, I need a glass of water. <clears throat> I have a cold, I'm sorry. So after I did that, you know, and it took about three or four years, I, I got it. And that, and that talk about, um, that talk about how everything gone to hell, and, and, and I really got into it, that it, it really only took in that overfishing paper to realize that most fish stocks were trash, that most estuaries were trash, that most salt marshes and mangroves and seagrasses and kelp forests and coral reefs were all trashed. And we were really doing a good job of getting the deep ocean in the same track. But although this stuff was really obvious, we were just all hunkered down in denial. And I got an extraordinary amount of crap when I published my overfishing paper. I had people stand up in public lectures and deliberately stomp out because I was obviously a jerk and it couldn't be true. And I guess the biggest triumph is that now it's boring because everybody knows that depressing stuff is true, you know? And that was sort of cool. Um, from all that, I guess there are three things I want to say. The first is the importance of history. My father was an historian. He was also actually a master mariner sea captain. And he was a hell of a lot more proud of that than his PhD from Harvard. He taught me two really important things. He taught me that change is inevitable and that above all to distrust the arrogance of the present. The arrogance of the present is what Daniel Pauly's brilliant shifting baselines syndrome one-page paper is all about. Shifting baselines has led us to an entirely new historical ecology 
of the oceans and understanding of the astounding magnitude of what we've lost. I'm really proud to have been a major part of that. But you know, there's a lot of pushback. And, in, and we've really got to win this battle because incorporating that new perspective that comes from history, that comes from shifting baselines is absolutely central to everything that we want to achieve to make the oceans better. The second thing, the second thing is, and this is Dr. Doom speaking here, you know, it's like my cheerful TED talk. Apocalypse is really around the corner. The science is abundantly clear. We are on the verge of not one, but hundreds of tipping points that will cost us dearly about everything we value in the oceans. And not in the distant future, but like tomorrow, or, you know, next year. That is unless we develop some kind of actual holistic approach, that when we think about one thing, we actually think about all the rest. And we use that to resurrect and, and somehow maintain the health of the oceans. What's going on is what my former student Terry Hughes refers to as death by a thousand cuts, meaning the synergistic interactions among all the bad things we do, which are almost always in their synergy, worse than any one of those things alone. You can see it on Caribbean reefs that were the subject of my big, huge Caribbean report, and you can see it in the Gulf of Mexico or anywhere else. What we do instead of having that more inclusive approach is to focus on the fad of the moment, like an oil spill or climate change. And in doing that, we ignore the rest. And that's why the marshes and the coral reefs keep on dying, and we just really, really have to change that. But you know, I'm married to this, this Pollyanna lady over there, and so she sort of brought me, yeah, 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 yeah. And she sort of brought me from doom and gloom to hope and change. So I'm gonna steal from Nancy and, and say that when she and Enrique Sala, Enrique, I hope you're here because we need to have a drink, uh, and I, we started that Eigert program in Scripps, and we drowned the students in bad news, and they just ran away screaming. But when we woke up and focused on solutions, they got excited and useful. One of the consequences of that is that NOAA has had 17 now fellows from us in the last 10 years. I'm really proud of that. And 10 and 10 federal employees, including the people that need presidential approval for those appointments. That's not bad for a decade. And then, of course, there's troublemakers like Ayanna Johnson, wherever you are. I'm really, really proud of Ayanna. As Nancy likes to say, we don't train doctors to write better obituaries, but that's what ocean science has been doing for a long, long time. Like monitoring without acting on the results. It's sort of like watching passively a murder taking place and doing nothing to help the victim. We have to stop hiding behind the excuse of needing more data. We know we're in trouble, so what are we going to do about it? We know not everything we have to do, but we know so goddamn much stuff it could keep us busy for another 10 years. But you know, the problem is action is scary. You have to stick your neck out and it's guaranteed you'll be wrong as much as you'll be right. And we all have egos, so we sort of hunker down. But that's what adaptive management is supposed to be about. And we have to start taking risks and be brave and stick our necks out because you know, by God, it'll work half the time and that would be really cool. This is a challenging but really exciting time for the oceans. It's challenging because the task ahead sometimes seems hopeless and at the very least just incredibly enormous. But it's exciting because we know most of what we need to do to start to make a difference and we're even starting to do that here and there. And most of all, it's an incredibly lot of fun 
to do good science and work in the oceans and yell and scream and make people mad and make a difference. So I, I got to do thank yous, right? I want to thank Johns Hopkins and the Smithsonian and Scripps for providing nurturing environments to work and think. I have been an extraordinarily lucky and privileged person to work in such extraordinary institutions. And also, huge thanks to my graduate students and my postdocs who never stopped challenging me, telling me I was a jerk, and teaching me more than I ever taught them myself. And then I got to mention Randy Olson, the bad boy who drives me nuts. Randy taught me two things. He taught me the crucial insight of always saying only three things, because otherwise people go to sleep. And he encouraged my lifelong belief in the constructive power of storytelling and narrative and involving people in everything we do. But most of all, Nancy, thank you. You've put up with me for, oh my God, almost 40 years. You've been my greatest supporter. You've been my greatest critic. And I love you very much. Thank you all.